Great. Well, welcome back. If you want to open up the chat screen and uh, whoever was doing the uh, the writing in your group, if you want to copy and paste or write in there what your definition of leadership is. I don't know how you found that. I think it's surprisingly hard, isn't it, to try to come up with one short definition of what leadership is? Being in a role of influence, which maximizes the efforts of your team, guides a group to achieve a common goal by delegating different tasks. Excellent. So you've got some key things there in terms of you're trying to influence people. You're trying to influence a group. There's a goal. There's somewhere we you're heading towards. Yeah. And also you're delegating out. That's, that's kind of more of a function of what you're doing. But yes, this is leadership. That's great. That's grand. Anybody else got something? We talk about like being a representative of the people and also yeah. like someone who encourage or inspire a group of people towards a common goal. Great. So encouraging, inspiring people towards a common goal, defending, you're, you're their spokesperson and their defender as well, really, aren't you? In that, with what you're saying. Yeah. Shared vision goal, guidance, biggest servant. That's very good. Yeah. Let me uh, share this. Let me give you one of the, the best known secular definitions of leadership. Um, and it's this. This is uh, not a Christian definition. It's just one of the best sort of management mantras. It is leadership is a process whereby a person influences others to achieve a common goal. Any thoughts on that? What do you think is good about that? What do you think is not so good about that? Any thoughts at all? Just feel free to shout them out. I mean, one thing that's good is it's that a process, it's not an overnight thing, it takes time. Um, you're talking about influence, you're trying to move others rather than just uh, coerce them. It's about a group of people, it's a common goal, you're trying to achieve something. What's not so good about that? It says nothing about how you do it. So you could manipulate people to get your goals. I mean, advertising is a great example of manipulation. It manipulates me to buy the car, to buy the toothpaste, because it'll make me more sexy or whatever it is. I don't really care the means as long as you buy my product. And whose goal is it? Well, it's the goal of Google or, or Facebook or Amazon or someone who's making a lot of money. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an ethical goal. It doesn't say a lot about that. It's also singular. It's a person rather than a group. So as a management definition, it's fine. But if you were to take it into the Christian world, into the church or into the CU, you can see immediately that it has some flaws. I'll give you uh, the best definition that I've seen of Christian leadership or spiritual leadership. The problem with this is it's too long, but let me unpack it anyway. I'm gonna take it phrase by phrase. And uh, Lawrence says it is a servant oriented process. And by servant oriented, that is really key. But the danger is that it's not just about serving people. If you think that your role is mainly to serve people, you will become a doormat and you won't be able to lead. But this servant oriented is first and foremost that you're serving God, you're serving Jesus. And because you are serving him, you are able to serve others. But it's not the other way around. So this is spiritual leadership is servant oriented, but it's servant oriented towards God first. So Spurgeon famously said to his congregation, he says, I will be your servant, but you won't be my master. Jesus is my master and therefore I'll serve you. But spiritual leadership is servant oriented. It is a relational process. You would know that. Um, Psychologists would say that some people are task orientated, some people are people orientated. But in Christian leadership, you cannot ever be purely task oriented. It is about moving people. It's about moving hearts and changing them through the gospel. Whereby those who lead, that is plural. In the Bible, elders, leaders is never singular. It's always plural. It's a plural thing that gives protection. But it's leaders together who lead under God's leadership. I've already mentioned that before about being servant, leaded, uh, servant oriented. And using their God-given capacity, that is that every single one of us has got a different capacity, different mix of gifts, different number of hours we need to sleep. Some of us are married, some single. One day you may have children. It'll affect the capacity that you have. But God is not asking you to be somebody else, but he gives you God-given capacity. And you seek to influence others, that is not to manipulate them. You've got to do that consistent with God's character, and it's towards a kingdom-honoring goal. In other words, it's not just... I want you to build my kingdom. I want you to build up my organization for my glory. No, it's always about building something for the king. So that this definition of Christian or spiritual leadership, which is has the disadvantage of being too wordy, actually takes a good starting point and expands it to say spiritual leadership 
has more to it. It's about who you're serving. Primarily serving Christ so that you can serve others for God's glory and so on. And that's important because we are about leadership. You guys, as uh, perhaps leaders of your committee, or if there's a smaller CU, leaders of your CU, are trying to do it in a way that's God glorifying, not just trying to please your staff worker or trying to please me or trying to please your church leader. Does that make sense as a definition of leadership? Is that fair enough? Grand, we'll be looking at character primarily, and I'm just coming back to this slide here that who we are character matters most but what leaders do then is define where are we going kingdom honoring goal how are we going to get there how am i going to lead my team in a way that is consistent with the gospel and what are we going to do next and what i want to turn to then is is target of where are we going which is all about vision and i think that of the three of these this is the most important thing for the leader to get this is the vital thing and it is trying to help your people see where can we go as a CU this year. And it is about vision. And I should just say that, uh, what is vision? You might have heard mission statements, vision statements. Vision really is, as you get from the word vision, as you get from the idea of seeing, it's, it's what will the future look like? Let's say you slip into a coma or you fall asleep like Sleeping Beauty for five years and you wake up. What does the CU look like? If you could imagine that, if you could close your eyes, think, what should the CU look like in five years' time? If you like, that's the vision. The vision is that perfect future that we're going to head for. And what we have in CUI is we have a vision statement. We have a vision that is the key thing about this is it is the same vision for staff and for students and for supporters. The language is a little bit work in progress. Your predecessors and student council from last year were working on it, as were the board and everything else. But... At the moment, where we've got to is saying, we exist to give every student in Ireland an opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that in five years time, if I was to wake up and to see this vision had been realized, it would be that hundreds, tens of thousands on your campus, but students all across Ireland have had the opportunity to hear and respond. I'm not saying they've all become Christians because some we know from the gospels will reject the gospel, but they've had an opportunity to see, to hear, to smell, to taste what the gospel looks like in real community as well as explained or lived out before them. That is the vision. And why does vision matter? Well, vision matters because it does a number of things. First of all, it grabs you by the heart. It's it's the magnifying glass that says, this is the thing that we're heading for. This is the thing that's worth getting out of bed in the morning for. And then it unites, it brings together, or it unifies, it brings together people from different backgrounds, different denominations, so that they're heading for the same thing. And you know, that's why CUs exist. They exist for, with, with church members from a variety of different denominations who are able to lay aside secondary issues for the sake of mission for the sake of the gospel for the sake of making jesus famous on your campus it unifies it doesn't say everything about baptism or charismatic gifts it says this is the one thing that we do that's our vision and it energizes and a vision or a good uh, a good goal worth going for that the leader is able to articulate says come on together we can do this together by god's grace let's head towards this it captures the imagination. It should unleash creativity. Mission on Stranmullis campus should look different from Queens. It should look, look different from Athlone. It should look different from Cork or Waterford or Carlo or Trinity or UCD or anywhere else. But it should release that creativity, which al allows you to live out the gospel in your particular context. And a vision means change. Leadership is always about change. If you're not about change, you're not leading. You're just making people comfortable. You're just maintaining the status quo. Because leadership is always saying, there is a better future to head for. Let's go for it together. Or there's a worse past to avoid. Let's not go there again. Let's head forward to something else. And so leadership is always about saying, look, there's something better we could be aiming for. Come, let's do that together. And of course, in Christian leadership, it makes sense because the Christian life is always about change. It's always about change. The gospel, I mean, the, how did you become a Christian in the first place? It was admitting that you couldn't fix yourself, but you came to Christ. And from conversion onwards, you don't stay the same. So Paul uses various metaphors like us being in a spiritual battle, but he talks about the hardworking farmer or the marathon runner or laying hold of the prize and running with perseverance in, in Hebrews, the race set before us. And there is 
direction and purpose so there's a destination in the christian life and in the christian life if you're standing still you're actually slipping backwards because it's a progression of getting to know someone it's growing in the relationship with jesus so leadership is always about change but that shouldn't be a great surprise because the christian life is always about change it is about growth towards a goal which is of being made perfect in christ and enjoying him and knowing him and seeing him and you would know that different people have different attitudes towards change some people love it some people hate it but as christians it shouldn't be a surprise and in your CU2, you want to head towards something. You're not trying to diss the previous committee, but you're just saying, look, they've been going this direction. We are still going this direction. This is where the next committee after me will be going. But we're moving forwards because if I'm standing still, I'm going backwards. And so vision or leadership is about a future that I want to aim for together. And you articulate it in such a way that people will come with you. And that's really what the leader's role is. It is helping to discern the vision, communicate the vision, and implement the vision. We're going to look at those three things. Discern the vision, communicate the vision, and implement the vision. And when I say discern the vision, the vision is given. In other words, uh, for your CU, you don't have to go away and write a new vision statement. Your CU exists to give every student in Trinity an opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel. Every student in Galway an opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel. But the question for you is, what does it look like here? What will that look like on my campus? What will it look like for that to be worked out in Stranmilis, that in 12 months time, in five years time, everyone does have an opportunity to come across Christians, to hear the gospel, to have it presented to them? What will it look like? And one of the keys then for you to think about with your committees is, what could this look like this year? But also, what will it look like in three years time? And the danger for most or maybe all committees or all leaders is they never think long term. They only think short term. You see that with politicians. They only think about are they going to get reelected? You see it with business leaders. They only think beyond their current financial year, because if they fail this year and don't make profits this year, they get fired. It's very hard to think long term. And since you guys are doing a job for a year or a role for a year, the challenge is for you to think, what am I handing on to my successors? They have the same vision. That's one of the key things. They're going to be carrying on the same direction. But what does it look like here in this campus that they will carry on? But in three years time, what could it look like? Of course, what it look like in your context. But there's a very well-known quote, again, in management literature, that people consistently underestimate, sorry, overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in five years. In other words, the consistent failing in all businesses for all leaders is a lack of vision. They're not actually thinking what could the better future be out there. They're only thinking, how do I get through my to-do list today? And you can see that working out because if you do a to-do list for your studies or whatever else, you do a to-do list for today, Thursday, I only got through five out of my 10 items. But over the course of a couple of years, I usually don't think big enough about where I could be or what I could be doing or, or what my uh, what the CEUs could be doing. And so the challenge is to think through what would it look like to work this out in my particular context? Does that make sense so far? What we're gonna do is uh, try to put you into small groups uh, back into the, the breakout rooms just for two minutes, literally two or three minutes, and just to start to talk through what could that look like? How do you think that vision could be worked out differently in your different uh, campuses and contexts? And what could it look like in a few years time? So just a couple of minutes and then I'll call you back in. So that's discerning the vision. What would it actually look like in my particular context? And the key one, the second one to come to is communicating vision, because I think this is the key, especially since the vision is given for us, that is that we exist for mission on campus. We don't exist to be just a comfort or a safe group or a youth fellowship or anything else. We exist for mission. And the thing is, how do you communicate that? And the first is that you as the leader have to own and live and breathe the vision. I don't mean you have to have it tattooed, although if you want to go ahead and do that with a CUI logo, I'm very, very happy for that. But in other words, the CUs exist for mission and that has to be the motivation for what the CU leadership 
believe and trust because if you're the leader of your committee and the committee think that the CU exists just to keep Christians safe or just to be an escape from the world or just to be a holy huddle then you're never going to be able to communicate a mantra that says we exist for mission if the reality is that you don't feel that in your heart it's got to be kind of um well it's got to be something that you you own that that you say yeah that's okay that's what we exist for there are other things that we do but this is the key and everything else has to feed into this and the other thing about vision is that vision leaks vision is always leaking it's like a sieve it just leaks away Lawrence who I quoted earlier says this he says we need to tell as many as we can as much as we can as soon as we can as often as we can and in any many ways as we can because vision leaks and you will find that within a few weeks, but certainly by the time the next lot of freshers come in, they just don't know that CUs exist for mission. And the thing is that CUs were set up nearly a hundred years ago for mission and every single year, because we are Christians and we love comfort, our hearts tend away from something that's difficult. We tend towards being safe and you have to re-envision or relive that vision every year. So you do have to tell it, but there's no excuse for being boring, by which I mean that there are 101 different ways to tell the vision, to say it, to illustrate it, to tell stories about it, to pray about it. There are 101 ways to make the vision sing into people's hearts. In a moment, again, I'm going to put you back into small groups because this is absolutely key, just to think through how could it be that in our CU, the vision for mission to give every student on our campus an opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. How can we say that in different ways that are actually attractive? And the reason I say there's no excuse for being boring is that if you think about the gospel, any page you open in the Bible is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every single page talks about him, but it talks about him in 101 different ways, whether that's story, Old Testament narrative, parable, allegory, poetry, prophecy. There are all sorts of different ways. And you think about how Jesus, he says, I've come to preach the kingdom he's come to die but he does it in ways that are lived out he explains it he tells stories about it he does miracles and things that illustrate it there are all sorts of different ways of living out of showing what your vision is so if you thought about let, let's say we were not in a covid world let's say that you were meeting as normal on a thursday night or a tuesday night as a cu what elements of that particular evening do you think you could use as a way to tell the vision that you exist for mission, illustrate it, show stories about it, live it out, ways of articulating it, weaving it through what you already do so that everything you do points towards your vision, points towards the purpose why you exist. Does that make sense? Because I'm going to put you into small groups. I'm going to put you back into the breakout rooms. You can give me some feedback this time. You've got slightly longer, seven or eight minutes this time, just to think what are the different ways in which we could illustrate, show, or articulate what our vision for mission is. Not just in a standard Tuesday night meeting, but in different forms as well. So let me put you back into those small groups. And after this one, we will take some feedback. And welcome back. Any ideas then? What did you, maybe one idea from each group just to share ways in which you could illustrate or live out or explain the vision for mission to your CU. I think we were a, a bit off topic, but I guess what kind of rings home into the question um, was not allowing it to become a clique or a place where we internalize and, and become too comfortable around other Christians. That while it's not always the most comfortable, it is about, about moving out. Yep. Very good. Excellent. Grand, let's, let's uh, have another one from another group as well, and then we'll think a bit more. How could you help articulate a vision for that? Someone must have had you guys look at it, all you creative students. Give me some give me some ideas. No pressure. Tell me what someone else in your group said. So it's not you.
I think we got a bit off topic, but like we were talking about how like we should um as a committee have like a vision, like share our vision as a committee. And we we're talking about how like we should always go back to like the big picture and how um what like biblically we should be going for and like maybe Bible studies or um worshiping within the committee itself and also like seeing how other CU or other organization are um, trying to reach out to students and also um, get inspired by them. So I'm not sure if we answer the questions. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thank you. I'll come back to that. That's very helpful. How about from the last group? Anything you'd like to share as well? Um, one thing we said was to be reminding people like what Christ has done in us and just like about his amazing love, like helping them really know that because once they know that, like then their hearts will be more like, wow, I really want like other people to be a part of this amazing family and like this love and all of that. So like just really teaching them that like it's kind of an indirect way to like get that focus on mission again. Yep. That's very helpful. Thank you. Those are great. Thank you. Um, let me just share the screen again. I think what's quite interesting about some of the answers that you gave, so you're right that um, the constant pressure for every CU is that it is not a clique, it is not an inward facing group of people who just want to know each other, it is an outward facing group. But what's interesting about some of the feedback that you've given there is it, it was more about what you do rather than why you would do it. Um, by which I mean this, let me see if I can pull that up. You need to tell people, you need to explain to people why, because that's what grabs their hearts. That's what lifts their eyes to see why they should come to see you, why they should bother going to a small group, why they should pray. So the what, doing a Bible study or worship as a committee, the, the looking to other um, other CUs or, or, or teaching everything. The what is important, but what doesn't motivate? What matters is the why, it's the reason, it's the heart level thing about why you exist. That's what you need to keep communicating. So I'm not saying that the what doesn't matter. Bible study matters. We know that. We want Christ exalted. We need to see him. Otherwise, we won't go out in mission. But we need to keep articulating why we exist. In other words, why do you go to see you rather than to a church small group? Or why do you go to see you as well as a church small group, I should say? Because the CU has a particular why that is different from a church small group. And you have to be able to articulate this why, because that is what will grab people's hearts. So just as an example, um, if you're giving notices, so quite often, if you have a standard, a normal CU meeting, sometimes the notices are the most deadly part of the evening, aren't they? And they go on for 45 minutes and everybody feels they have to say something. But what you can do as a leader is say, look, if you're going to give a notice, you have to first tell me why it matters, why it ties into our vision, our, mission, our vision. If it doesn't tie into our vision, then you can't give it. In other words, if this thing you're giving a notice about doesn't tie in with our purpose of giving students an opportunity to share the gospel, then it's not a CU thing. It might be a good thing. It's not a CU thing because we exist for mission. We don't exist for just being a cozy club. So as an example, let's say you're going to have a CU social or a Kaylee. There's two ways to give a notice. One of those is bad and one of them is good. The way to give a notice that is good is to say, look, we exist for mission on this campus. To do so, we want to be able to show non-Christians that we are normal people. We, we enjoy all God's good creation. Therefore, we're gonna have this social and we're gonna invite non-Christians in. The bad way to do it is we like each other. We just wanna have fun together. Let's have a social or a, a Kaylee. That's kind of the clique that's turning in on yourself. But it takes just a wee bit of imagination, maybe five minutes to try to work out some wording. What I've just given you is rubbish, but it's kind of, we exist for mission, therefore we want to do such and such. Or if you're giving an advert as to why would you have small groups on your campus? Don't say we have small groups so that we study the Bible because that's the what. Of course we study the Bible, that's absolutely fundamental, but that's not the thing that's gonna grab my heart. We, we, we have small groups because we want missional communities. We want small groups of, believers on campus who are standing with each other to reach out in mission to their friends to reach out in their faculties therefore we study the bible therefore we pray but you don't focus on the what on the behavior you focus on the vision on the purpose because it's the purpose that will lift people's eyes so why would you come to the prayer meeting 
because we're going to spend an hour praying. No, that's what you do. You come because we are an outpost of God's kingdom breaking in on this campus. We're a people who are called as a royal priesthood and we are totally dependent on him. We cannot stand on this campus as Christians. We cannot survive in our in our lectures unless we stand together as believers and want to stand for him. Why would you go on a church search, et cetera, et cetera? So that what you're trying to do is every time you're saying something um, in a CU meeting, again, I'm just using the, the example of a CU meeting, you're trying to tie it back to the fact that we are missional, we exist for mission. And the more you do that, slowly it catches with people. Every single one is like one more Velcro hook that will help to catch their hearts. And sometimes it'll sound to you like you're repeating yourself, but you'd be amazed at how hard it is to get a message across. Vision always leaks. You have to find ways of saying it. And it does take a bit of time, but this is the key job for you as a leader is to find out how do I articulate that in a way that's not boring, is not repetitive. Now, I may well use the same phrase, maybe at least once every, every evening, I'm going to say we exist to give every student in Athlone an opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel. But in itself, that just becomes a mantra that falls on deaf ears. So don't not say it, do say it, put it in your emails, but also show it, illustrate it. And of course, um, as Timothy was saying, we're not just a clique, you have to be doing mission. But when you do mission, you then have to talk about it. So, you know, we, we want to get our students to read Uncover Mark with a non-Christian friend. Well, when there's someone in your CU who's doing it, get them, interview them, get a small story so that every single week, or through your emails or whatever else you're doing, you've got an illustration of someone who's seeking to do some form of mission or how the prayer meeting is for non-Christians. It's not just for people's exams, that kind of thing. So that you're articulating it. And I would say that this issue of vision and communicating is the reason why CUs fail. A lack of articulating vision is why CUs fail. And I would explain that by saying, you can have a 300 strong CU, but if it's not doing mission, it is not a CU. It is a nice youth fellowship. It is a cozy club, whatever, but it's not a CU. And CUs fail when they cease to communicate that we exist for the mission. We are heading towards this direction. And you as leaders, this is the key role. It is finding ways to articulate it. And that's countercultural. And others on your committee may ask, well, what do you do? You know, they may say, well, look, I organize, I organize the prayer meeting. I organize this. I organize that. What are you doing? You're just talking. But actually, that's the key role of leadership. It is sharing a bigger vision that people want to catch and therefore will work together towards. And that's why I'm going on about it so much, because it is the key thing. And you have to own it, live it, speak it and find ways to communicate it. Very briefly, let me go through this last point here, which we will come back to. It's also about implementing it. It's all very well to have a vision and to talk about it, but you need to carry it through. And we will come to this more uh, next time in the last session. But a vision without action is just a dream. It's not difficult to talk hot air, but you actually have to sort of work it through so that it starts to come out. And what you're trying to do is give people a godly sense of expectation. Vision should always be just slightly out with my reach. Not impossible, but just slightly, just something that's aspirational, something that lifts my heart to want to head towards it. And what we're doing is we're praying that God would answer this prayer. And the key thing about vision is it enables you to say no to things. I think I might have said last time, I can't remember if I did, sorry, but if you're making decisions, the whole definition of strategy is how to make hard decisions between two good options. If you have a good option and a bad option, that's not strategy. It's just common sense that you choose the good option, not the bad option. But strategy is there are lots of good things you can do and you have to choose what is the one thing I will do well? What is the best thing rather than doing two things badly because you have limited resources? And if you have a vision, it enables you to say no to things, even if they're good things. And so, yes, we exist for mission. That means that I will foreground certain things. Perhaps it's mission events. Perhaps it's a mission week. Uh, perhaps I'm going to put more of our funds as a CU into this particular event or into publicity for this mission event and not into this social or this ball or whatever else. But it's because we exist for mission and it enables me to say no to things that I would like, but that aren't actually key. And the last thing to say is that not everyone will be on board. You just accept that when we were saying earlier that uh, leadership is about change, that the gospel is about change, that is awkward for people. And sometimes people walk 
it's why is it that every CU starts with 5,000 freshers and that by week three, there's only two people left at the CU? It's because not everybody gets it. Not everybody will be on board and that's okay. I'd love everybody to be on board, but it's okay. My own experience in CU was that I was involved kind of in the first year, then I kind of disappeared. Um, and it was only by third year, I did a degree in Scotland, so it was a four year degree. It was only by about third year that I really got what the CU was about, got involved and became one of the leaders. Um, people will not always be on board, but you articulate why you exist. You want them to go, I understand why you exist. That's why I don't want to come rather than I don't know why you exist. I don't know why I should bother wasting my time. And our hope in prayer, of course, is that more and more hearts will be captured with that vision for seeing Christ exalted on campus. But it is about being a mission team rather than just being about a group of people who keeps everybody happy. Any thoughts on that? Any questions? Any comments? Um, before we close, it is just past seven o'clock. So. That makes sense. I think the key thing about um, leadership is that, um, well, one key thing is it's not easy, but we have a God who is able and who calls us and who has a heart for students on your campus more than you do and more than your CU does. And CUs through the years have proven God faithful that when they've stepped out in faith and sought to proclaim the gospel, that students have come to know him. And our heart's desire is that students across every campus in Ireland this year, there will be at least one student on every campus in Ireland who will come to Christ. We pray for many, many more, but we're asking that. And CUs exist to give every student an opportunity. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the gospel of your son that has brought us into your family, that we are secure in Christ, that we are safe in him. And because our hearts are thrilled by seeing who Jesus is and by being close to him, we want to draw others to know him too. And we do that out of a sense of deep failure and weakness. Thank you that even Paul said that it is in our weakness that your strength, your grace is made evident. And we pray that we as leaders would be able to help our committees and help our CEUs to see that it's worth going for, that your glory is worth everything, that it is worth it to call other students to come and know you. And help us please to be able to communicate that with our CEUs and to help them to move forward, to take that one step this year, this semester, even during a COVID year, that will help them to draw others in to know Jesus Christ for their joy and for your glory, we pray. Amen. Grand. Well, thank you very much, everybody.